Okay, and you should be seeing the screen now, so please shout out in there. Let me know if it's coming through all right. And uh, you should be seeing my SimeFX desktop coming through on your end in all its live high-definition glory, depending on your screen size. And looking good. Excellent, excellent. And let me just hide my control panel over here. Now, for those of you that are in that aren't in the chat room yet, you're going to want to be over there because I actually watch the chat room on the other computer more than I do the, the things going on in the webinar. I use mainly the webinar control panel for managing things. Although, you, if you want to chat on audio or anything like that, you can raise your hand up there in the, in the top of your webinar control panel. You can raise your hand and use your mic, and you can actually talk to everyone, ask questions, and interact over the audio. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on it. Just make sure you're in the chat room as well that's on SimeFX. So I can see if you have a question or an issue or anything like that. Okay, let me pop up in the Lightroom here. And looks like everybody's, yeah, it looks like we got a good group in the chat room there. I think just about everybody's there. It's a small group today, but that's cool. We'll have fun anyway. So I guess kind of a little recap. You know, we started with Lightroom Essentials and understanding the catalog, importing images, the grid edit. Everyday Lightroom on week two, we went to folders, collections, virtual copies, develop module essentials, using presets, exporting watermarks. Then uh, last week in the Lightroom Pro, we looked at the super workflow, some local corrections, essentials, working with brushes, some basics on getting better dynamic range, working with file quality. We got into channels a little bit. And uh, here we are this week on the Lightroom Master. And you may or may not have been at all the previous workshops, but uh, you should be able to follow along real easy here. And today we're going to look at the power of channels, uh, not only color, but black and white, and talking about making really good black and white images. And just in general, things we can do with channels. We touched on it last week, and we touched on it in the Develop Module week. But it's the redundancy on channels is really good, because each week we're going a little bit deeper and looking at different things in relation to channels and channels are super powerful I don't want to overlook those because they are really really effective and let's see here just watching the chat room making sure everything's working on this end you guys should be seeing my screen oops let me get rid of that okay there we go alright so we're gonna start this week off with the power of channels, color, and black and white. And let's, let me just grab something here. And let's just take an image like this one, for example. And let's just leave it. Okay, this, this is a piece from Tufa Sunrise. And I'm just going to crop it a little bit. And just for the record, just so we know what we're dealing with, this this was actually the final. It was a stitched panorama. So the final is like this. And I've printed this up to about 60 inches, and it holds up really well because it's got a lot of pixels in it. But since this is a raw file, and I want to kind of stick with raw files and keep it simple, we're gonna I'm just going to kind of stick with this one here for now. Now, first of all, let's look at a couple things with channels. Let's, let's kind of recap a little bit with channels and just make sure we're understanding what you can do with channels. Channels are so powerful, and I use them. I use channels actually way more in Lightroom than I do in Photoshop. Not that they're not powerful in Photoshop. I mean, some of you may have read Scott Kelby's The Channels book or and things like that. I mean, there's tons you can do with channels in either application. But in Lightroom, channels are almost a rudimentary tool, and I think sometimes people kind of let them go. I, I, I've seen a lot of effects and you know I'm always downloading and trying presets and seeing what's out there seeing what other people are doing and it's funny because usually I'll look at presets and one of the things I do and <laughs> this is a little bit vain but one of the things I do to try and kind of gauge what somebody's preset experience is is I'll go down and I'll look at the channels I'll apply a preset and then I'll look at channels and see if they if they tweak the channels or not and not that, not that that's really the deciding factor. I mean, you can certainly make a great preset without channels. You can do a good process without channels. A lot of it depends on what you're trying to get to. But a lot of it for me is curiosity, seeing how many people are taking advantage of channels. And if you go back to my early presets, when I started in like Power Workflow 1, uh, things like that, I, I didn't, it took me a while to really figure out how powerful the channels were because we have all these things up here and the exposure and the, the, the curves and the split toning and all this stuff. And we kind of play with channels a little bit, but I didn't really delve in as much as I should have early on uh, the, the year, the, in the years 
directly after Lightroom was released and play with it. So as time went forward, I started messing with it more and really finding that there's a lot of power in channels. And we touched on channels last week in the context of how can we use channels to better manage dynamic range. And it, kind of the concept was, okay, what, what, what are we trying to do? Let's say we're trying to get a sky bluer. We can darken the blue channel and we can darken the blue sky. And then we can increase the saturation of the blues. And then we can combine that with curves and brushes and things like that. All this stuff we were looking at last week to maximize the information in our files. So, but going beyond that, let's look at channels on a more base level. I'm, I'm resetting this, so you're actually seeing this image change pretty drastically. So here's this photograph, and let's start with looking at color. And what I want to cover today is also kind of the concept of I want us to think in terms of seeing the light, seeing the color, seeing whatever it is in the image that we're trying to accomplish and having a visualization. If you're like an Ansel Adams fan and you read the Ansel Adams photography books, and there's lots of other people that talk about it too, you know that visualization is really important. Being able to visualize from the very start what you want to do with a photograph. And this starts in camera, not in the computer. And it kind of harkens back to the six keys of image quality, having all these steps in place and planning what you want to do with a photo and knowing where to go with it. But there's also a visualization of editing. Now, with digital, we have the advantage that we can revert anything we want. But, you know, if I sit here and I look at this scene and say, okay, what do I want to do with this? Now, let me just reset this completely. And you see it's pretty plain and flat and not a whole lot there directly out of camera, Okay. Now, there's, there is some light here this morning, but as we, those of us that use Canon know that, that the, uh, <laughs> the raw files out of Canon cameras are very much raw. They're very flat, and yeah, that's what they are. <laughs> um, so here's a basic process. I probably applied a preset. What have we done to this so far? I've got a little bit of exposure, some saturation added, a little bit of, of curve that I've applied to this just to get the tones where I wanted, and that's about it really right here. But... In the final, obviously, I worked with the channels quite a bit. Now, let's go back and look at the final again. This is what I was going for. And what I would have done here to process this image, just to recap workflow for me for a fine art image, is I would have actually gone in and done each of the three images that made up this stitch separately. Uncropped, full, I would have done the basic process and the color channels and all that first. Then I would have gone in and stitched, and then I would have started working more details and done more critical burning and dodging and all that sort of thing. Now, the reason I mention this is because we're going to be talking about files and managing and integrating with Photoshop and all that kind of stuff today also. And when we particularly when we're when you're doing stitching but really with anything you know you want to maintain that consistency and also in terms of the file quality you want to be able to keep things as clean as possible so the more I can do in Lightroom as we talked about I think it was last week we don't want to be going back and forth in terms of Photoshop Lightroom Photoshop Lightroom it's okay to keep opening a file in Photoshop that's the same file but if we keep getting a new file, you know, let's open a new copy of this file, and let, now let's open a third copy, and now a fourth copy. Keep getting these generations in our files. That can be, personally, I think that can be pretty destructive to quality. It also uses up a lot of space and can get really confusing. So I'll do all my basic stuff, including channels, in Lightroom to start with, and then work into my, my process. Now, looking at this, I would say, okay, I've got the sun over here from the right just peeking over this horizon. And it's hitting these two towers of Mono Lake. And, okay, super cool. So I would go in and look at these different channels. I would probably start by thinking about light. I would say, okay, let's... And I would experiment, too. But I would say, let's darken the reds. Now, we talked about overdoing it last week. You can see how much it, it can damage things. If I darken those reds too much... I mean, it's actually bringing all this crazy red out of the sky, but it's really gnarly. And, obviously, that's not what we want. So I might darken the reds a little bit. But, on the other hand, if I lighten the reds... That gives me some different luminosity, too. In this particular image, messing with the reds is seems to be pretty delicate. It's affecting things a lot. Now, here we get into the oranges. Look what it's doing to this grass. Let me crank up the oranges more than I would actually do it, but just to illustrate. Look what's happening. You can really change the light. And maybe I shouldn't say change the light. You can manipulate how the light is shown and really 
enhance the vision of what you have for a photograph by working with these channels because you can take the individual colors and control effectively how luminescent they are. And this is the luminance channel we're in. We're down in here in HSL and I'm in luminance right now. We're gonna look at some of the other ones as well. But you know, let's say I wanna bring up the oranges and let's look at the yellows. What if I darken yellows? Drop these down a little bit. Now I'm gonna go to the lighter side. Interestingly enough, it's, it's clearly more in the oranges on this one. The yellows aren't affecting it as much. Let's go down to our purples because there's definitely purples in this sky. And you can see up in the upper left particular there, I'm working those purples. I don't want to do it too much though. It's easy to overdo it here. I'm going to try the same with the magentas. Just try and work this sky in some different ways. And I'm not going to try and get this exactly to where I had it. My main, what I, what I want to illustrate here is potential for what you can do with things. The blues, you see it's darkening my mountains there in the background. There's a lot in the blue channel. So it's really bringing a lot into those mountains or I can do that like that and it's kind of like this weird HDR-ish ugly thing. But that's probably not a good idea. Seriously. Okay, so I'm going to drop my blues down a little bit. Brings a little bit into my sky and it also makes these mountains richer. All right, now... Look at my aquas. So but understand what I'm getting at here. What I'm doing, I don't always, sometimes it's surprising which channel actually affects things. I mean, I might look at this and say, okay, the, the yellow channel is going to have a huge effect on this, when in reality, the orange channel is having more an effect on this. But the point is being able to look at the scene and saying, okay, what do I want to do? What's my subject? Where do I want to draw attention to? What do I want to be lighter or darker? And this kind of all comes down on the same vein as the burn and dodge stuff. And, and those, a lot of you may have seen, I, we, I did schedule the burn and dodge workshop and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I have an online webinar coming up for burn and dodge. But the concept of that is also you're controlling tone and direction. And with channels, we're also controlling tone and direction. I use this on portraits a lot. I'll just bump in there. And a lot of my presets already have this in there. And I'll just, I'll just bump up the reds a little bit because a lot of times faces have reds. Now, I know we've all taken photos as well, particularly like at our wedding reception or something where your light's not great and everybody's been drinking. So everybody's kind of red anyway. <laughs> and, and you go through these photos and everybody's face is just like this glaring red. They're all like Oompa Loompas. And one little secret you can do to really help that and a, 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 a preset like Portrait Power or Reception Light Magic or something like that from Power Workflow 3 actually does this is... It's, it drops the saturation of the reds and oranges a little bit that you would see in a face. And I could go find one here, but I think you'll get the idea. So it'll save us time just to, just, just to talk about it a little. And then I would go in and actually increase the luminance of the reds. Because what it would do is it would lighten their face, but it would also desaturate some of the reds out of their face. Get a little bit more natural look. So And it's, it's not just for ugly reception light that that works good for. I'll, use a, I'll lighten the reds all the time on portraits. Most of the time, I'll do a little bit of lightening of the reds because I want their face to be a focal point. So if it's a portrait, their face is a focal point. So typically, depending on where I'm going, if I make reds lighter, if I make the subject a little bit lighter and then the supporting elements a little bit darker, I'm going to get more of a draw of attention to my subject. Now, it doesn't always work that way. It depends on the key of your image and how your light is supposed to look and all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of a rule of thumb that I use. Now, let's go back to the final, and you can see where I was going. Obviously, I did a ton of work here, but you can see how I just completely brought all this to life. Now, this comes into play with Burn and Dodge big time, and we'll get into that later. But started with channels. Obviously, I'm sure I used some brushing up here. I mean, I really brought a lot back into this sky, and worked the channels in terms of, you know, what do I have in these rocks? What information am I trying to bring in? I mean, I just love this one because it was kind of a verification to me that, yes, I can get a ton of detail and maintain the quality really high. And it, it was very educational. And I, I like the photo. It looks great printed. But all these channels, everything's relevant. Look at all the color we have. Up here, we have blues. We have magentas and purples up here. We have blues along these mountains, okay? We have reds in the rocks and in the grasses. We have yellows and a lot of oranges in these grasses, so we can really control what happens there by manipulating those channels. Look at what happened here. By, by dropping the orange down, I just completely killed the foreground. I also killed some of this, too. I mean, it's ugly. But you see how much power a channel can have. The same with hue and saturation. 
you can bring up individual channel levels of color, whether it be blue or red or purple or whatever you need to do. It gives you a ton of power because it's not like there's just a red, green, blue channel. You've got red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, magenta. You have all these subtle variations that make up these channels, and that's extremely powerful. Let's reset those so when I come back later, they're not screwed up. Okay. I mean, when I, when I look at this myself, it's hard for me to believe that it was so flat to start with. I mean, this was really early morning light. I'm not even sure. I wonder if this is actually the final one I used. I think it is, but I might go back and check. This almost looks like a moment before the sun hit the rocks. Because in my final, we can see here that that there's a little more sun on the rocks. So I'm going to go back and double check these files. Now, okay, here's this one is, though. But let's look at the raw. Okay, there's a little more light on those rocks, but a, a raw file is very raw, particularly in my uh, what I, I found from Canons. I think Nikons make a raw file that's, um, I mean, it's, it's raw, obviously, but each camera does it a little bit differently. And the files from my 5D Mark II and raw are, tend to be very flat and plain. But that doesn't mean the light's not relevant. The light we start with is still very relevant. Okay, now what about black and white? And the concept is similar for black and white. Now, let's take something, we were looking at this one last week, so let me just pop into this one here, from Yosemite. Using this in all these workshops, I might actually decide what I want to do with this photo and how I want to process it, because I've never, it's just, it's still just sitting here, I haven't worked with it too much yet, but, um, okay, so let me just reset some channels, and you can see things changing around, because obviously I've probably applied a preset or something to this before, so what do we got? Not a whole lot of edits up here. This is pretty much raw. I'm just going to go ahead and actually reset this with the exception of the, the crop. So we can take it from the, from the ground up. Now, obviously what I would normally do with a black and white is I would start with a black and white preset to kind of get me where I wanted, to get me a starting point. Uh, I would use power workflow or I would use silver shadows or something like that and get a starting point. But for purposes of this, let's just look at these channels. So first of all, it's a little dark. I'm going to brighten it up a bit. And I'm going to actually start with a basic preset, just a general correction that I would often use on import, like super simple. Let me reset that. Super gentle. Super gentle is really soft. So just, just to get my general tonal range, kind of where I would normally start an image from. All right. So at that point, If, I'm, if I know I'm going to black and white, and it's it's good to know. I mean, it's honestly good to know in camera when you're making the exposure initially so you really can visualize what you're trying to do with it. But a couple of different ways to do it. One way is simply to go down here to the black and white tab right here. And if you click black and white, it, it immediately converts it into black and white mode. And now you've got your channels. And it kind of did an auto process. So it just kind of guessed and it put the channels all over the place. But what I would always do with a black and white is manipulate it. You know, I might say, okay, these trees are green. What happens if I bring up these trees? In this case, not much, which is interesting. Like I said, a, the channel that you expect to affect something doesn't always. Now, what if these trees are in the yellow range? Okay, there we are. These trees have a lot of yellow on them because of the way the sun's hitting them. Let's go back real quick to the original. See how much yellow is in these? So the yellow light is hitting these trees. And in particular, what we accent when we hit the yellows is the, is the edges of these trees. So look how we start to bring this alive. Okay, let's see what happens when we mess with the oranges. Kind of the same difference. These bushes down in the foreground here. Now, with channels, you can also click this. And it brings up the little picker. And you can click on an area of an image and drag up or down to darken or lighten the channels that pertain specifically to it. See, now we're going up there, and it's really cranking up the oranges and yellows and really giving us an almost infrared look. Probably a little bit too much. Okay, so let's go somewhere in here. Now, there's another way to do this, and a little quick tip on a black and white. Changing the white balance affects a black and white. So, I don't fully understand why, <laughs> but if you change the white balance, it drastically affects the way Lightroom plays with the black and white. Now, a lot of times I'll leave it alone and just work with my channels, but if I'm trying to get something different, it's almost, 
it's changing the whole dynamic of how the image is processed and how the other settings are affecting it by manipulating the white balance channels. Even though the white balance technically is affecting colors, this original image is still color, so it's still affecting the way the image looks. Look how, look how it's bringing out these clouds on the top. Okay, so let's tweak with that a little bit. Now, as, as a side note, let's go down to my channels, and I'm going to drop these yellows just a bit. I'm pushing those a little bit too far up. I generally don't like pushing channels over 40 or so. That's not to say that you can't, but you do have to be careful. Let's see how our details look, and we're keeping this in the rocks. Now, on a final version, I don't have a final version to show you, but I'm obviously going to be doing a lot of stuff, particularly with El Capitan, working the, the tonals in the, uh, in the rocks and subduing other areas that aren't critical. But you get the idea of where I'm going. Now, let's look at something else like a portrait, and, say, uh, and let's just say we were converting that to a black and white. Let's go to a general tests. And let's take something like this. Go into develop mode. And I'm just going to go to the HSL. And I could just go to black and white here. And I could start working the channels. And this works on black and white as well. You know, I might bring up the reds and the oranges to lighten up her face. Darken the greens, which are kind of already darkened. But I might want to tone those down. Same with the blues. Get the water tones down. This would need some burning and dodging, obviously, as well. Here's another way to do it that is, it, these days it has a little bit less control, but you can actually leave it in color mode. Okay, so we could go to the saturation layer and turn down the saturation of all the channels. We could also do it globally. We'll just do it this way for now. Okay, so we've just removed all the saturation, so now it's a black and white photo, and then we can actually use the luminance channels to affect the photograph. And see how I'm, I'm, more, I'm really specifically affecting the reds in her face. Her skin tone would be in the oranges. Let's go down to the greens. That's going to affect the trees. So the concept is the same, but it does work differently. And sometimes, again, you just have to try things because sometimes this method will hardly affect an image at all for whatever reason. Sometimes this method will do a, will do a lot to an image. So there's different ways to process the same image. And when I make presets and my own effects, I mean, I, I, I mix it up. So I get different varieties. So I have a selection of things and I can try things and get myself a good starting point. If I'm manually tweaking, I'll do whatever, whatever I feel like should be done. Now, as a rule, I would say just use the black and white channels if you want black and white and stay in the color if you want color. But don't be afraid to drop your saturation and then work specifically with those color channels and go that route. Let me just reset these and drop the saturation up here, okay? Now, you can see if we do it that way, it's not really affecting it much. Again, we're talking about under the hood stuff in Lightroom, all right? But if I, so, so make sure you do it this way. Make sure you manually dial down these channels is the better way to do it because otherwise it just doesn't change much. So effectively what you've done is you have a black and white image but Lightroom still sees it as a, as a color image, and these channels still affect it. Ooh, now it's getting ugly. Too far. But you get the idea. Okay, so let's see here. Same thing with something like this. Here we started with morning light, flat photograph, work the channels, and obviously burn and dodge and stuff like that. But you, particularly like in a landscape, you can really bring out tips of trees and bushes and stuff and give a lot of feel of texture and tonality. And in, uh, in a portrait or something like that, you can bring out flesh tones. You can subdue certain colors. Whether it's a color or a black and white you're working on, it doesn't matter. What's this? This, this is actually a reference. I did some manual painting in this river. To, to accent the currents that were that were there, and then I blurred it in the final version to to bring out the the currents in the water. But that's more that's more burn and dodge topics. Okay, any questions about uh, anything with channels or anything like that before we move on into some other interesting discussions? Let me just check notes here, and uh, if anybody wants to get on the
audio, you're welcome to. And Al, did I drop off the chat room? I'm actually checking to see what's going on here. I think I am on the chat room. I should still be there. Uh, John, the link for the chat, I actually posted it in the in the notes of your GoToWebinar panel, but if you're not seeing it, simeffects.com forward slash chat. So if anybody's not in that chat, head over there now, S-E-I-M effects.com forward slash chat. And uh, also the resources, the downloads and the notes and stuff for the Lightroom Power Workshop, simeffects.com forward slash L-R. Taking a quick break here, making sure everything's taken care of. Any questions on channels or anything like that, feel free to shout out in the chat room or raise your hand in the uh, attendee panel, and we'll put you on the audio. Okay, hang on. Just taking care of a couple questions here. And John, I see your hands raised there. I'm going to go ahead and put you on the audio real quick. Are you there, John? Hello. Thought I heard you for a second. Make sure your mic is connected. I do have you unmuted. Oh, I hear something over there. <laughs> it's gone again. There you are. Oh, you're looking for the chat. Okay, so you're good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Let me, feel free to raise your hand again if you have any questions. No worries. And uh, those of you in the chat room, am I in, I mean, I'm just going to check. Somebody suggested that I might not be in the chat room. Looks like I'm working. And if nobody has any questions, we'll keep moving on. But if you have any, shout out now. All right. Get rid of this. Perfect. Okay, so we can recap this, but that's kind of a look at channels. I mean, it, it, it's hard to cover everything because... You know, you can spend days going out making photos, trying to see things differently and manipulate it in channels. But the subtleties of it are very powerful. And don't be afraid to jump in and start working with these because I think sometimes it'll surprise you what manipulating those channels, particularly if you start on the raw file, do that before you go into Photoshop or something like that, really can give you a lot. So number two of today's workshop, noise, detail, sharpening, and beyond. And... Let's talk about this. Al, yes. I mean, the premise would be, and there's nothing wrong with playing around, but the ideal premise would be, you know, you have a vision for how an image should look. I mean, if, if we're standing and we're overlooking this vista and we're getting an experience from that that's not going to convey exactly into the camera, or if we're standing in a park doing a senior portrait, there's a feel there that we're trying to convey and... Really, everything we do from start to finish is about trying to convey that feel, not to just snap a photo and, and make it. But if, you really, if we really want to make a masterpiece, to from the very start, the time we're on the camera, slow down, take our time, and m expose the image right, and then follow through and carry it through in all our edits to meet the, the vision, as it were, that we have for that photograph. And channels, I think, is, is just one way to do that because you can really manipulate light on a subtle level. Let's see here. Look at my detail stuff. Okay. Oh, this is going to be fun. So, noise, detail, sharpening, and beyond. Yeah, go ahead, Vince. Vince says I have a question on RAW versus TIFF. Shoot. Do you want to? You want me to put you on audio? Just looking for raised hands here, or do you just want to shoot it into the chat room? Okay, let me find you here. I don't see your hand raise. I think I found you. Unmuting now. Are you there, Vince? Yep. 
can indeed go go, go for it. I, everybody else should be able to hear you too. I think is that just real quick. I want to make we we haven't actually tried this. I don't think before. Is everybody in the chat room hearing Vince? Just a couple of quick shout outs. Yep. Okay. Perfect. You're a little quiet, so maybe lead into that mic a little bit. Go, but go for it. Awesome. Sure. Awesome. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Right. Gotcha. Uh, no, there's not. And that's why in Power Workflow 3, for example, and it's the only set I do this with because it's a lot of work, but because of that and because sometimes we do need to do that, there's a set of JPEG, TIFF, PSD presets, and there's a set of raw presets. Because for some reason, and I don't know exactly why, but the, the default settings on a JPEG versus a raw are very different, and it takes a, a preset completely differently. So if you take a preset made for raw, apply it to a TIFF, sometimes it'll give a cool effect, sometimes it'll just be garish. Now, a little tip, when I'm, let's say you have a raw preset. And what I do, if when I'm designing presets, if I have to make a JPEG version, what I do is I take a RAW and a JPEG of the same version and set them side by side. And th this is actually stuff that we kind of be talking about in the Lightroom Prodigy workshop, but, but we'll touch on it real quick here. I would put the two side by side. I'd apply the preset I like to both. So I, have, I could see on the RAW how it's supposed to look. Then I would go to JPEG and tweak it around to, to where it looks close. It never gets exactly the same because it's a different format and it takes the settings differently. But usually what you're dealing with is way too much contrast and, and uh, a, a, a level, a curve space that's wrong. So what I start with when trying to take a raw preset and make it work for JPEG is I'll apply it to both, put the raw one on the JPEG, and the first thing I'll do is go in and, and reset the, the contrast down to default, which I believe on a JPEG is zero, and then I'll go in and reset the, the curve to, to a, uh, a flat curve instead of a medium or a, or a heavy curve that a lot of times we do with a raw. And then at that point, you just, you know, you mess with brightness and all kinds of things. So you can do it, but there's no quick magic to do it. I've, I've, I've wished I could make an instant preset that would say, okay, this, this is the JPEG version, and then I didn't have to make different versions of all of them, but alas, I, I have no answer for it. Uh, now, interesting you say, though, are you sending, you're sending images to your retoucher. Are you editing in raw? But then you're not sending her the edited image? I mean, I, I don't understand quite what you were getting at there. Aren't you, if you're exporting her... <laughs> okay. Sure. No. Uh, an action is Photoshop, and I get this question a lot because sometimes people actually go and they buy my stuff, and then they say, hey, why won't this work in Lightroom? And, and that's why I try and define them really clearly on the site because actions are definitely are Photoshop all the way. Presets are Lightroom all the way. I would say, you know, and, and, and we're getting into other territory here, but, I mean, a retoucher is great, can save you a lot of time, but don't overlook, and we're going to get into this in a few weeks or about a, maybe it's a month, in the, particularly in the cloning and in the burn and dodge workshop that we have coming up because there's no way a retoucher can ever truly match your vision exactly they can get everything looking close and save you a ton of time but don't overlook the tools in photoshop and what you can do with burning and dodging and things like that on your own even once they've retouched the image to really make it your own so i mean that, that's something i would encourage you to play with more too because lightroom's awesome but there are limitations 
Super. All right, let me know if you have any more questions, Vince. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Okay. So, g good questions. Um, let's look, up, look at noise detail and sharpening and all that good stuff. One of the things is in terms of detail and increasingly detail has been super important to me because I'm going in and I want to make large prints. And I think, you know, even if you're making a 16 inch print or if you're making a 60 inch print, it, it's detail in these, in these files is extremely critical in large prints, but even in medium prints, it's very relevant. You know, if you've ever gone into a gallery of somebody who's shooting large format film, four by five, eight by 10, something like that, Oftentimes, if, if they're really good, you'll be astounded at how much detail there is. And in the digital generation, it's almost like it's been forgotten because everybody shoots digital, but film actually has a lot more information, which is why those of you that follow me know that I've been dabbling with 4x5 lately, particularly for my large prints. Not that our digital cameras aren't good, but, but these are things to think about. And again, I keep mentioning it, but it goes back to the six keys of image quality, which is linked in the notes for this, for this workshop. Um thinking about what you want to do with an image, kind of coming back to visual, visualization, you know, let's say you're planning a portrait session and you are trying to think about where, where this is going. What do you want to do with it? The, the family portrait session I did last, last fall that I made a 70 inch canvas of, I didn't know what I was going to be producing exactly from that, but I knew this was a huge family. My goal was to sell them a large wall portrait because they had a large home and a large wall and it fit and a large family. So obviously trying to make sure that my detail and noise and all that stuff was balanced as much as it could be was critical. Balancing and planning ahead have a huge effect on noise and detail, particularly detail. I mean, I see people all the time and they'll do a photo and it's a really cool photo, but the thing is they did it on the fly. They didn't stop and plan, what do I want to do with this photo? And you're not alone. I mean, I do this too, where I get in too much of a hurry and maybe I didn't use a tripod, or maybe I didn't think about my shutter speed enough. All these things are relative. I mean, if you say, let's say we take a photo and you're hand holding at a 30th of a second. And that's, you know, you can get away with that. Sometimes you can get away with that and do really well if you're a good hand holder. But let's say you now want to make a, a 30 inch print of that. Well, a Facebook image is one thing, and we're kind of in the Facebook generation where, you know, you post an image on Facebook and everybody likes it and wow. But remember, you're looking at that on a, at 700 pixels, you know, five inches wide on somebody's screen. What about when you make a real piece of art out of it? And you go and you, and you blow that up to, you know, 16, 20, 30, 40, 50 inches, what's going to happen? Everything matters. So noise, maybe I should change the order. Detail starts in the camera. It starts with your planning, your stability. And if you want to look into that more, so I don't take too much time on it, go and look at the six keys of image quality article that I did a while back. Now, then we come to noise, and they kind of kind of intertwine. Let's take the, this image here and go into the develop module. This is from the Grand Canyon, obviously. So, you know, what do we got? I'm sure I was tripoded here, and I had ISO 800. Here's what happened, actually, here. And again, this comes back to everything as cause and effect. I was set up one direction, and I had, you know, in, in this tiny little space, I got there like two hours early because I knew the crowds were going to be there. So I had crowds on every side, people trying to get into where I was because I got there early and <laughs> suffered in the corner waiting for the light. And it was really, you could, you could barely move. So I had a view camera set up over here. I had a digital set up over here to the right. And the light did didn't do what I had hoped it would do. It, it was way cooler over here on the right. So I was trying to get over and, and get some images before this light went away. And one of my best exposures, I think this was semi-tripod. I don't think I could get it locked in or something. So I was kind of resting it on top of my view camera, giving it some support. But, you know, it, it, it wasn't a lot of light. So I, I needed depth of field. I'm down to 140th of a second and 25 millimeters. So I must have my 17 to 40 on, but I'm trying to get a, enough shutter speed and I'm just rushing, trying to get this image. So I don't lose it entirely. And I had to crank it up to ISO 800 to get 140th. Ideally, I totally would have been at ISO 200, but okay, that's four stops less. So I'm going to be down at, you know, 20th, 10th, fifth quarter of a second, something like that. And the, the newer generation of digital cameras did great. I mean, the detail is good here, but I was kicking myself later because I said, you know, if I had had 
ISO 200, I would have had a little better image quality. But in terms of Lightroom, how do we manage the image quality? And let's look down here at the RAW. This is the final PSD after I did all my burning and dodging and all that. This is the RAW. It is the processed RAW, I believe. Let me make sure. There's the processed RAW before cropping or anything like that. So you can see between the two, I mean, the final Photoshop work did make a huge difference. But I got it as close as I could in Lightroom. Now let's get in close here and look at what we did with details. So let's look at noise first. Because the basis for my detail was all right. I stabilized my camera to a degree. I had a 40th of a second. That's really pushing it. It's easy to lose a shot that way. But I didn't want to go over 800 because I knew I'd get even more noise. The 5D Mark II does really good at 800. It honestly does good up to 6400. But with a landscape, if I'm going large, I want it as good as possible. Uh, and the same goes for a portrait. We'll probably look at some portrait stuff here too. So I've got my sharpening up to 37. Typically, I'll do a little bit of sharpening, noise reduction, all that kind of stuff. Again, coming back to doing as much as I can in Lightroom before I go to the final Photoshop. Now, a lot of times I won't do much for grain. Sometimes I'll do a little bit. The grain in Lightroom 3 was really valuable to me because what the grain does and what I learned about adding grain is, first of all, there's a difference between noise and grain. Noise is really artifacts, crud, and generally it's unappealing. It's digital noise. Grain is a more organic film-like feel. So what I'll do a lot of times, particularly with noisy images, is I'll add grain back in. Usually not a lot. You see I'm only at 9 right here. And you can manipulate settings and things like that. We talked about that in the uh, develop module part of the workshops. But, you know, if I crank up my grain, I'm actually getting a really grainy image. But if I keep it down there a little bit, what it does is it almost equalizes out the noise a little bit. So I've done a little bit of noise reduction. Let me reset the grain to 0. Okay. Where's my noise reduction at? Right here. I don't have a lot of noise reduction on here. So the camera, I mean, this. let's set the noise reduction to zero. Here's out of camera, and it looks pretty good. But I did a little noise reduction. Now, bear in mind, with noise reduction, when thinking about detail, if you crank it up too far, look at this. See how things start to get pasty? I hate the plastic feel. And there can be an instance where it works, but particularly on a landscape where you're trying to tout detail and say, hey, look at this big, beautiful landscape or this big, beautiful portrait. Really watch that because it can kill you, not literally. So I'll keep the noise reduction pretty low, and I might even come back after the Photoshop edit. One thing I will do after the Photoshop edit is final detail work. I might not add a lot of grain or a lot of noise reduction to the Photoshop edit, or as, it, as I call it, my second generation file. That's when I go to a TIFF or a PSD and have a second generation of the copy. Now I'm no longer working with a raw file. What I'll do is sometimes do a little bit of that, and then I'll come back into Lightroom with that and do some final tweaks before I export to print or to web or something like that on the second generation file because now I can see exactly what I'm working with. I will do my channels and things like that as much as possible before going into Photoshop, but sometimes I'll hold off on a few of the details or do a little bit on the raw and a little bit on the PSD. Now, what happens when I put a little bit of grain, and it's probably hard to see on the screen, on this small small screen capture we're looking at in the webinar, but a little bit of grain kind of equalizes my texture, Partip particularly in a noisy image. The more grain, I'll do a little more noise reduction, but then to keep it from looking pasty and try and keep things looking natural, I'll add a little bit of grain back into it. And that can be really valuable. Now. Let's look at something that has some more serious noise and talk about some dealing with that. Here's one here, shot at ISO 25,600. This is maxed out for the 5D Mark II. And this is interesting because it's, it's actually the first image I got that I'm like, wow, I really could actually print this and enjoy it, even though it was done at ISO 25,000, with the exception of maybe the occasional wedding reception image. Now, a lot of times if I had this much noise, I would go into black and white because the grain fits the black and white a little bit more. Now, let's get in close. Get ready for the damage. Look at that. There's a ton of grain in there, but it's fairly even. There's a ton of noise in there too, but let's look at this. Let me turn off the detail settings. So without sharpening, noise reduction, color noise reduction, without any of that, this is what it looked like. This is out of camera. 
That's like old school noise. That's noise. That's color noise. That's luminance noise. That's artifacts. That's all kinds of bad stuff. Okay? So Lightroom 3 is really good at processing this. I mean, it's still got noise, but it's getting rid of a vast amount of the crud. And there's, there's never anything I'm going to be able to do about the fact that this is grainy. But what I can do with it is say, okay, I want it to look as good as possible. I'm going to sharpen a bit. I'm going to do some noise reduction. you got to find a balance here because noise reduction tends to take away detail. So sometimes you'll to compensate, you sharpen a little more. But again, if you do it too much, then you introduce more artifacts and things start looking unnatural. So what I'm getting at with noise detail and sharpening is balanced. Balance from the point you take the photograph to the point you edit and understanding how to manipulate your tools. Again, this is something that I make some presets for and I kind of have these starting points for presets. Some of them are real subtle, like the, the film magic preset in Power Workflow through three, a lot of times when I'm all done with everything, I'll apply that to every image and, for example, a wedding collection because it's just a real subtle application of grain and sharpening to just make everything natural feeling, okay? In this case, I've got my noise reduction at 20. What if I try and crank it up to, say, 100 to get rid of all this bad noise, okay? It gets rid of the noise, but it gets rid of everything else too. Now, on a Facebook image, I might get away with it. Well, not even not even then. I mean, it's it's completely destroying the edges of these branches, Okay, so what could I get away with? Like I said last week, almost always if you crank a slider all the way up, you're going to lose too much detail. I, I chose 20 for a reason. I mean, sometimes I'll sit there and I'll play with a slider and change it one, two points. I'll go back and forth, and I know it's subtle, but I'll, I'm fanatical about that, and I'll, I'll mess with it to try and get it to feel exactly the way I want. If I turn off luminance noise reduction altogether, it's really noisy. So for whatever reason, and I know, but... I went to 20 because it's a balance. I did lose some detail, but it knocked off the knocked the edge off my noise a little bit. I'm never going to print this 70 inch. I might be able to get away. This has a ton of noise, but there's still some cool details here. And and what I like about this is that because it was fast, the stars aren't trails. I'm seeing actual stars in the sky behind these trees. This is at the Grand Canyon, and I just like the way these trees are going up in here. This isn't an image I've released. I've I've not decided, but I love night photographs. And I really liked this tree and the way it was silhouetted. But the only way I was going to get it was to crank the noise up. I did some longer ones, and they're probably not in here right now. But the longer ones were star trails. And as a rule, I hate short star trails. If you're going to do star trails, you know, I want to do star trails. This is two hours. Okay, that's star trails. But if I do like two minutes, it's like these little blurry star trails. So I either want clear or I want real star trails. That's just me, though. <laughs> um... And I'm using, but I'm using an extreme example here just to, to give you guys some ideas of how we can manage noise and just to get us thinking about how we deal with it. I mean, obviously, from the very start, the balance starts of thinking about what ISO you're going to use, how far you can push it, how large are you going to want to print this, what potential does this image have. And the more you do this and the more we start to visualize, that's why you know, guys like Ansel Adams knew how important this was. Because when we stop randomly making photos and, and start stopping and thinking about what we're making and why, and this, it changes everything in the process. I don't want to get too off track because this is Lightroom, but it really does. Now, my sharpening's at 40 with a radius of 1.5 pixels. I've got my noise reduction. And what have I done down here? I probably put some grain in here. I, do, I put 18 points of grain. Let's take the grain off for a minute. So what I did is by adding that grain in, it probably doesn't show up very well on the screencast, but by adding some grain in, I gave, I gave a more consistent pattern to the noise to try and make it feel a little less digital. If I added a ton of grain in, let's see what it does. I mean, it's very grainy. But what I wanted, what I hate is digital crud. So I'll use a combination of editing, noise reduction, sharpening, grain, whatever I can under the circumstances to make the image close up at detail feel natural and organic. There's ne You never really know until you make a print. In general, with an image, a portrait or a, a pictorial, if I'm doing a, a wall print with it, I don't really know until I've made a 24-inch proof on the Canon. Whether, even if it looks good on the screen, I may print it out and it's not what I think it's going to be. But I'm retaining quite a bit of detail. Overall, it's coming out all right. Let's look at another example. How are we doing on time? We're okay? We are going to have to move on, though. Okay. 
here's one here, and this is the the original exposure for 120 120 minutes of night. So it was a two hour 140 minutes of night. Excuse me, it was a two hour and 20 minute exposure. Now if we look up here, it only shows it as a 1759 second exposure. At some point, at least with the Canon cameras, it just quits counting. So it do, it won't actually tell me what my exposure. I used I used a stopwatch. We see here on an exposure this long though that was so long. And this particular frame did not have the dark curtain noise reduction. So that's something you'll want to look into, too, if you're doing long exposures into the minute range. It'll take a blank frame, a dark frame, and use that to, to, to map out the noise and then subtract the really bad noise. Now, the, the grainy noise you can get away with, but what do we have here? We have these white, let me get into two to one here. Look at this. You have millions of these little dots. These aren't stars. The stars are the streaks going by. And they kind of look like stars, but if you think about it, they don't make any sense. So even with the noise reduction on, let's do this without any Lightroom settings. Okay, they're even worse. Lightroom does get reduce them a lot, but it still left all the specs. I spent hours working with this image, and I did take a dark curtain frame separately after the fact. And probably would have been better off to do it in camera, but I did make a 2 hour and 20 minute dark curtain frame, so I had a noise map to try and then use that technique in Photoshop to subtract the noise, which we can't go into here, but but that, there's a technique for that that you, can, that you can look up. The thing is, is there was just a ton of it. And at some point, you're going to get into stuff that Lightroom just can't take out. Now, you could get a plug-in. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of plugins like Topaz, Noiseware, that sort of thing. I, I, I wrote a review a year or two ago on Pro Photo Show looking at all these noise plugins. It's actually due for an update. But... Those can be a great tool to have in your arsenal, but at some point, I didn't find anything that would take this out. However, I did manage to, I kept working with layers and with the dark curtain and trying different things. I spent hours and hours and hours researching different techniques and experimenting and trying to get the noise out of this because I did not want to lose this image. I loved it. I had I had this one, and then I had taken a light one. I had set up hours before and just left the camera out in the exact position. So I had a lighter one, so my final could actually be an HDR of night. And if we look in close, here's the final, which actually still has some work. I haven't released this as a print yet. But let's load this up and take a look. It's pretty clean. And I used a combination of dark curtain and mixing layers in Photoshop. At this point, this kind of noise, I definitely had to go in, into Photoshop. And even then, I had a tough time. I managed to pull out most of the noise and artifacts. Some of the, the bigger ones I'll be going in and manually working on before I print. But I managed to get get it pretty darn clean and I was really thrilled when I finally 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 did it because it meant I didn't have to throw this photograph away uh, but if you want to learn about that th that's getting into Photoshop kind of stuff and crazy noise reduction for long exposures but I, but if you go to f164.com I did write an article on this when I posted this image and I and I went into detail on how I finally managed to get the noise. So go look at that post on f164.com if you're into long exposures and you want to talk about that in relation to noise. Now, let's look at one more real quick. See if I can find it here. Let's look at something like this, which is the Chamberlain's and this is the one we printed at 70 inches. Now, I think this is actually the final process. So you can see here, I did the same thing. This was shot at 200, F11 at 160th. So I had time to plan for this. I mean, I planned for this portrait for like two weeks. And I had tons of light kicking in from the front to, because I had this horrible time of day that I had to shoot at. Obviously, I mean, if, don't, don't shoot at 11 in the morning in August out in the sun for a family portrait if you can avoid it. But I punched a ton of lighting in the, in the front. I did a lot of post work. I spent a lot of time on this one too. But what we did have is wasn't a lot of noise to begin with. So that's a good thing is uh, shooting an ISO 200 kept the noise down. So I could really focus on having as much detail as possible. But you can see here, I, and I remember with this one, I did put a little bit of grain. I, I put a little bit of grain back into the faces, and it may not be showing up too much here. Let me bring it in closer. It's getting kind of pixelated when I go two to one. But you can see a little bit of grain structure in their faces. And a digital camera produces noise. It doesn't really produce a natural grain like film did. And the new generations are better. The new generation of cameras with something like Lightroom 3, after it's all processed, it looks a lot more like grain. 
but I find it's definitely an asset to add a little bit of grain in because it can keep away that pasty feel. You can go in and retouch and maybe you're smoothing skin and doing all this stuff, but then you can come back and add a little bit of grain to make things feel natural. And this applies to portraits, to landscapes, to whatever it is you're doing. Obviously, there's variables depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so that is noise detail and sharpening. And again, something we could go way deeper into, but I don't want to extend us too long here. Any questions? I'm going to actually check. Make sure nobody wants to get on the audio. You're welcome to raise your hand if you want to get on the audio. Any questions in the chat room? If you're not in the chat room, head over to simefx.com slash chat. Also, the resources and the, the download of shortcuts and things like that that I may mention today, simefx.com forward slash Lightroom. There's also a special 30% off any, any editing collection that I have on the site over there that is uh, just for workshop attendees. It's a special one-time use code that's uh, a really nice discount on any, any uh, pack that you want on SimeFX if there's anything you want over there. Watching the chat room here, any questions on details or any thoughts of things that we should touch on real quick before we move on? No? Everybody's good? I explained it so well that nobody has any questions at all. That's just awesome. Woo. Okay. You know what I'm going to do real quick? i got to go refill my water. I'm going to give you guys like three minutes, and we're going to take a really, really quick break. Don't go far, and uh, feel free to hang out in the chat room. I'll be right back. I just got to uh, make sure I don't dry out my throat so I can't talk anymore. All right, everybody, we are back on the air here, and uh, let me check the chat room, make sure we're all good. Hopefully, you all went and got a nice, cool glass of lemonade so we can jump right back in and wrap this up for the day. Al says, Gav, can you discuss a bit of the role of detail radius and masking play in sharpening and also perhaps similar subsliders under noise reduction? So, yes. And the thing is, this, for me, on a practical level, oops, let me get rid of the stuff I don't need here. On a practical level, I don't worry about it too much, although radius, I, I, I certainly use. I use all of them, but just to overview, taken directly from Adobe site, because no, my memory isn't this good to actually be able to say all this, I'll admit it. The amount is adjusting, uh, adjust the edge definition. I mean, you know what? I'm going to pull it up real quick. I mean, I, I got the gist, but I'm going to pull it up and just look at it. Just to review carefully with you. L I'll put it in Adobe's words. Amount adjust edge definition. of Increase the amount value to increase sharpening. A value of zero turns off sharpening. In general, an amount set lower to lower value produces cleaner images. I'm paraphrasing what they're saying here. Uh, radius is, like I said before, radius adjusts the size of the detail sharpening is applied to. So effectively, at least if it works like Photoshop, in Photoshop when you set the radius, you're defining how many pixels wide the sharpening radius is, and I believe it works the same in Lightroom. But as Adobe says, adjust the size of the details that sharpening is applied to. Photos with fine details may need a lower radius setting. So usually, I'll put it, you know, I'll leave it around one, one and a half, something like that. Now, there is a little secret I use with sharpening in Photoshop, and actually this is something that's in one of the updated detail presets in Power Workflow 3.2, I think it is. And what it is is I'll crank the radius up to like 20, and I can't remember the photographer I got this from. It was actually a Photoshop tip initially, and now I kind of use it in Lightroom too. I'll crank the radius way up, but I'll have the amount really low. And sometimes it doesn't work good, but sometimes it can give a really nice sharpening effect. So I might put the radius at 25, but only have the amount at 10, something of that nature. The detail adjusts how much high-frequency information is sharpened in the image and how much sharpening the sharpening process emphasizes edges. Lower settings primarily sharpen edges to remove blurring. Higher values are useful for making the textures in an image more pronounced. And masking controls the edge of a mask. With a setting of zero, everything in the image receives the same amount. With a setting of 100, sharpening is mostly restricted to those areas near the strongest edges. So, I mean, when I'm, you know, I, I kind of know what I'm doing with this stuff, and it's, it's, it's a good question, Al, but 
the reason I looked it up is just to make sure I'm saying it the right way. Because honestly, the science of exactly what's going on isn't super critical as long as you understand what you're doing with it. Not that it's bad to know all the nitty-gritty details. Maybe I should learn to recite that. That would be kind of awesome. But I would say lumin. Excuse me. Your detail. Oops. I'm look. That's that's noise notes. The amount and the radius are the two primary ones. I'll play with detail and masking a little bit. Uh, but honestly, I typically use amount and radius. If I'm making a preset or something like that, I'll work with all of them and try and get something that I that really really is nice. Um, same kind of thing, and you can look at this on Adobe site. I'll just kind of bump over it real quick so we can continue. And in, in noise reduction, luminance is the noise of the, your luminance channels. Detail controls the threshold of the luminance noise, which is, as Adobe says, useful for very noisy photos. So the higher values preserve more detail, but, but you can get noisier results, and the lower values have cleaner results but may also remove some detail. Or I interpret cleaner revol results to say more pasty results. <laughs> so you just got to find a balance in there. The contrast of the noise controls the luminance contrast. Again, Adobe says it's useful for very noisy photos. Higher values preserve contrast, but may produce noisy blotches or modeling. And lower values produce smoother results, but may also have less contrast. And the color reduces your color noise. That's what we saw in there, those weird purples and the color noise. Uh, and then the detail controls the noise threshold. Higher values protect thin, detailed color edges, but may result in speckling. Lower values remove color speckles, but may result in color bleeding. So again, pretty nerdy stuff. All this stuff is relevant, but play around with them and see what's working for you. And you can always go to the Adobe Help site if you need to review those, because that's where I take the information, just so I can accurately describe what all the sliders do no worries good question uh okay so let's look real quick we're gonna run out of time here soon so i gotta keep moving detail edits in photoshop integration now we're gonna touch on this quickly because we can't get into all the things that would go into a detail edit however The detail edits are very important. Let me just say this. There's no image on my wall in my studio that has not been into Photoshop. As much as I love Lightroom, Lightroom doesn't make really polished, refined images. Lightroom is a global editing tool for the most part. Yes, we have brushes and tools, and that doesn't mean we have to spend a ton of time in Photoshop. Lightroom is a workflow tool, as we've been talking about through this whole series. But Lightroom, for the most part, its its greatest power is in working global settings and working details and managing detail really well, keeping artifacts out because you you know dynamic range that kind of stuff because you can work directly with the raw file. But if I have a, a really good image that that I'm going to print with, it always goes to Photoshop because I guarantee you every single time I can make an image better in Photoshop by using detail tools, maybe a little clone here and there, and Lightroom's cloning tools are limited. A lot of times, it's something more localized like burning and dodging or something like that. And I'm not going to go really into burn and dodge because we don't have time, but uh, simefx.com slash BD, that just went live a couple weeks ago, and the burn and dodge workshop is an evening workshop just like this coming in August, and there's an early registration price. Head over there and check that out because we're going to have a lot of fun. I've been wanting to do this for a long time and really focus on burn and dodge. It's something I cover in the lights and shadows workshop when we have a couple of days, but it's going to be the webinars give us the ability to do something quickly with it. But let's talk a little bit about detail edits and Photoshop integration. So first of all, for people that might be new to Lightroom, let's look at a raw file and let me, let's go in here and apply a preset of some kind. So you just fix the flat making our blues really intense, but that's okay. Uh, so here's the thing. Command-E will edit in Photoshop. You can also right-click, edit in Photoshop. CS5 is in my case. Okay, so Command-E. And quick tip for when you're editing. This is something to think about in your workflow. If you go up here to Lightroom, 
Might look slightly different on a PC, but it's going to be similar. Preferences. Bring up the Preferences panel. External editing. Okay? Adobe RGB, that's a color space that has a lot of information. You could work in sRGB, and I always export in sRGB if I'm going to web, but sRGB has less color information in it. So I always work with one that has more color information. Okay? And bit depth, 16 bits. 16 bits will retain a lot more information going into Photoshop than 8 bits will. And as a rule, particularly with images that I'm going to be printing large, I always edit in 16 bit. It does slow things down. Sometimes it's a little grueling. But as I've said before, I don't spend a lot of time in Photoshop. My very best images always go to Photoshop. But if I go to a wedding, every image doesn't need to go to Photoshop. I, you, you know, don't get me wrong. You can make images look great in Lightroom. It's just if I'm saying, okay, here's my best five from this event, or here's the one I'm doing a wall portrait of, I can always make it better in Photoshop. It's just not always practical. I can't take 500 images into Photoshop and spend 15 minutes on each of them. It would, it would be crazy. And it wouldn't get appreciated because most of them are, if they're printed at all, are going to be small in an album. Okay, but 8 bits, I'm actually going to switch to that for right now just for purposes of speed. But it's the numbers are kind of there. I mean, 8-bit probably processes twice as fast as a 16-bit. So if your computer is really powerful, you may not notice it, but 16-bit definitely can slow things down, particularly with processes like sharpening and blurring where it's having to really work on a detailed level. Okay, but all I would do is hit Command-E, and it would pop this open in Photoshop. And, oh, I should have had Photoshop already open. It's going to take just a second. So bear with me while that opens up. So detail edits and Photoshop integration is the step we're on. And it should have said Photoshop integration and detail edits. Photoshop integration in Lightroom is really good. It's simple. It, it's not something we have to talk about a lot. I just want to make sure people understand. They, they, they talk to each other really well. Okay, so at this point what's happening is it's opening it up as a, a PSD. In this case, an 8-bit PSD. Normally I'd have a 16-bit PSD. So effectively it's taking whatever current settings are in Lightroom... You know, any presets I've applied, anything I've done, it's exporting out a copy. But instead of putting it on the desktop or something like that, like we would do with the export module, it's just opening it up in Photoshop. All right? Now, here it is, and I'm not going to get too much into working with it, but, you know, I might do... Uh, probably what I'd be here for is burn and dodge. You know, I'd be like, okay, let's start working details and seeing what we can do. Yeah, and let's kind of bring out different things. And then let's go to this burn here. And let's darken certain areas in the mid-tones. But then let's darken some shadows up here. And go like that. And really kind of bring this stuff down. Make things nice and rich. Let's tone, knock this down a bit. You know, So I would just start going through and working on this. Now, what would happen when I'm done... And I'm not going to process this whole image. I mean, in terms of everything I would do with a burn and dodge, that's something for the burn and dodge workshop because it it's, it's too in-depth. But I would go through and, you know, draw attention to where I want. I would work things and work it and work it and work it. And even, even in just 30 seconds, I changed things around. Kind of started bringing out the tree. But, okay, when I was done, what I would do, I'd do anything I wanted in Photoshop and then just save up in the file menu or command S and close it. And if we come back to Photoshop, what it's done, and this is beautiful, it just loads it in and puts it right with the original. And that's all there is to it. So it brings it back in as a PSD. Bear in mind, and that when I say second generation file, this, would, this is what I mean. Here's our raw file that we started with. We edited it. We went to Photoshop. We did some burn and dodge work. Here's a PSD. Obviously, we can't save, you know, Photoshop can't save out an edited RAW. You don't edit a RAW file. So now you're doing destructive edits. But now you can come back to, into Lightroom and you can do whatever I want. Usually what I do with a, with a sequence in terms of workflow is second generation, and then the final is my third generation that goes to, to print. So, meaning I'll do a RAW file, do my edits in Photoshop, then I'll come back in here and might say, okay, it just needs a little final tweaking. You know, let's add... On the final PSD, let's do a little more clarity, a little more exposure. Let's uh, drop the greens a little bit. I'll, I'll do whatever on that final image. Because Lightroom is still working non-destructively, even though it's on my PSD. So now these changes I'm doing on the second generation file, those will be committed when I export again. 
So if I command did command E once more and opened a new copy, it would open a new PSD. Now I'd be on a third generation file. If I can, I do a third generation file only to export for web or for sending to a printer or something like that. Because I don't want to get too much redundancy. I want to stay as close to that original raw file as possible. Now, also what you would see here, it doesn't look like it did this time. <laughs> Normally it would stack the image on top. It would stack the edited PSD or TIFF on top of your raw file, which is really cool because let's say you're doing a wedding and you do all these photos and you just take five or 10 into Photoshop. Before you show the client, you can select all, Command A, and then you could go to stacking and collapse all stacks right here. And typically it'll put the, the PSD right on top of your raw file. Sometimes, like right here naturally, it did for some reason not stack them together. Maybe I had a setting set wrong somewhere, but uh, that's a cool feature too. So the integration is tight. If I, if I hit Command D on this, what it would do now is it would say, what do you want to do with this file? Because now it's no longer a RAW. Before when I opened the RAW, it just popped open in Photoshop. Now it's going to say, what do you want to do? Edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. So I've made some changes now to the second generation file in Lightroom. Remember, we jumped up the exposure and the, messed with the channels a little bit on this version. So I could do that. I could edit a copy, which would mean a copy of the PSD, so it would make a third generation file, a second PSD, but not include the Lightroom adjustments or edit original. Now edit original is typically how I would do this. So let's say I've done some edits in, in Lightroom. That's cool. Maybe I see that I missed something that I want to do in my Bird and Dodge or I want to clone something out. I can still take my original back into Photoshop and let me just show you. Let me make a layer here and then let me take a brush. And let me draw on this photo. Okay. So I've done this on this other layer in Photoshop. Now let me save this back into Lightroom. And go like this. Okay, so I have this. And it's recognized the file's changed and that the metadata settings are changed. So I'm just going to overwrite Lightroom's metadata settings because there was changes done in Lightroom. See over here, the changes I made a few minutes ago, there's that exposure, there's those channels, okay? The cool thing is I can go back and edit the original file, the original PSD that Lightroom is now seeing. Remember, we're still on our second generation file. I can go take it back into Photoshop and edit it and not have to make a new copy, but still retain any settings I've done in Lightroom. So I've done my second generation. I tweak around with it. I make it the way I want. And now I come back in and let me brighten it up. I'm, I'm going to do it way overkill just so you can see. I'm going to put way too much blacks. I'm going to put way too much saturation. Ooh, wow. I could be a professional. Okay. So now I'm going to edit again. Watch what happens. Edit original. It's going to pop open my PSD, but it's not that edited PSD. I didn't edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. It just opened the PSD that's on the hard disk. So I could go and keep writing on this, and I could, uh, we could have, you know, the next version, we could have XGuy2. Look at that logo. That's cool. Okay. Now I can save again. Watch how it happens. It updates. All my other Lightroom settings are still there. It updates the file and then put, and then maintains whatever settings I put on there in that file. So I know this is pretty basic. I just want to make sure everybody fully understood this because you can go back to that original as many times as you want. You don't have to make a new copy every time to retain those Lightroom adjustments. And you're not going to see the Lightroom adjustments, but you know, maybe you did some final Lightroom adjustments for print, but you come back later and say, hey, I, I missed cloning that out. You don't have to open a new file and start all over and have a third generation file, you just edit that PSD. Lightroom will keep those settings, okay? So I know it's sad, but I'm gonna delete XGuy2 because we don't really need it. Okay, so that, you know, just kind of an overview of detail edits and Photoshop integrations. Any questions, I'm watching the chat room right now. The lines are hot, so hop in there. And if anybody actually has any audio questions, feel free to raise your hand in the GoToWebinar control panel. I welcome those as well. Do, 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 do. Any questions on uh, on anything really up to this point, but particularly the uh, Photoshop integration stuff before we move on and we're going to talk a little bit about plugins and extending Lightroom in the last few minutes we have here. No? 
three, two, one. Okay, no questions. I'm going to move on. Actually, wait, hold on. Carl. Oh, Al. I, okay, that was from earlier. Is my chat not refreshing? I seem to have issues with my chat on this. Let me make sure it's, I'm seeing what, what you guys are seeing. Al, I see that you said you put a question out there. Is this from earlier or is this now? I'm just reloading the, the chat room to make sure I didn't miss anything. This might be the, the question you asked earlier. Oh, there you are, Al. I see it. I don't know why I didn't see that. For some reason, my chat's not refreshing very well. I'll have to keep an eye on that. Okay, so Al said, sorry, where's that question? What format do you use to export the final image? And the answer is I don't have a specific format. I would either use, if I'm exporting, obviously, to web, it's got to be JPEG. In the past, when I was sending to a lab, it would be JPEG as well because that's what most labs would accept. There's nothing wrong with exporting a high-quality JPEG because it is taking the information that you're showing in that photo and it's displaying it. Where you run into problems if you work in JPEG all the time is that JPEG is compressed. So if you go back to a JPEG and now you want to edit it and do more with it, you're not going to have as much information to work with. So a JPEG is fine. These days, since I'm printing my own, I'll usually just open up a PSD in Photoshop and, and, and print from there to my Canon 8300. Or, for example, if I'm doing a, like a, a, a fine art release and I, you know, I say, okay, this is the final version, and now I'm releasing this as a limited edition, I'll actually export that version as a PSD, and it goes in a folder where I keep all those editions that I've actually released. And so I have that actual copy that's for sure that version that I'm printing, and I'll work with that one. But locally, I'll work with a PSD. If you're sending to a lab, honestly, you're probably better off just to do a high-quality JPEG. But there's nothing wrong with that as long as the images you're coming back to and working with are high-quality. Okay, so moving on real quick. Uh, be, I'll be happy to stay a little late and cover some questions, but we're kind of actually running late today with all this stuff we've talked about. But uh, let's take a look at plugins. And I'm, I'm going to kind of open the floor. We're going to transition just kind of into the after show and people chatting with this plugins thing because... It really depends on what you want to do. But in particular, I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that there's a lot you can do with plugins in terms of extending Lightroom. I mean, let's say, for example, we talked about it in, I think, the second episode of the Lightroom Power Series using the Lightroom Mogrify plugin to overlay watermarks. Now, Lightroom 3 will overlay watermarks now as well. The Mogrify plugin is still more powerful. So I might say... We pick a preset here. I'm just going to export a photo to the desktop. And let's call it, let's use the SS Web 800 preset. Okay, so I've already defined all this. And I'm not going to go into what the plugin does and how to use it because we did that in a previous workshop. But the Mogrify plugin overlays watermarks as many as you want on images. So it's really cool in that sense because you can have a lot of control. You can have one thing in one corner and another thing in another corner. Let's look at what it did here. You know, here's my signature in the right corner and Gavin Syme in the top left. It's pretty subtle because it's black and white. But you see the potential there. It also put a stroke around the image. So I would do something like this if I was sending images to a vendor or maybe posting on my blog or something like that. Time-saving stuff, coming back to the full circle with the workflow thing, using having your tools in place and knowing what you want to do. I mean, I could take a 1,000 photos and export them right here, go to export, and just, you know, take my signature preset and put my signature in the quarter of all 500 of these images that I have selected right here. Now, it would take some time, but it would be really powerful. Okay, so another one I use a lot, and there's no way I can go over all the plugins. I just wanted to give an overview of different things you can do with Lightroom plugins. Uh, a lot of the companies like Nick Software... Uh, on one software, those kind of guys, they have plugins for their programs, like Silver Effects, for example, that you can get a Lightroom plugin. Now, obviously, as you guys know, I'm into presets, and as we talked about earlier, you can do a ton with black and white and presets, so I may not use that particular one a lot, but there's a ton you can do with plugins. Here's one here. If I go to Plugin Extras, it shows my plugins, and real quick, just to kind of let people know, the Plugin Manager is really handy because it shows you 
all the plugins you have installed, the ones that are up and running are highlighted in green. The ones disabled are grayed out. And I can enable them. I just dis disable them things if I'm not using them very much at all to keep things speeded up. I don't want to slow things down. I don't know if it actually slows things down, but I figure, hey, why have that extra horsepower needed to run Lightroom? But uh, it also shows you where the plugin's stored, so and you can show it in Finder. So it's a great way to go back up your plugins. You can click the Show in Finder or Show in Internet Explorer button, and you can quickly take and copy all these plugins over, the plugins folder, and then you could do burn them to a CD or, for example, put them on your Dropbox and put them on another computer so you have all the same plugins loaded. So that can be really cool too. And of course, you can add plugins by browsing to the plugin location from here. You can remove a plugin completely, whatever you want to do. So the plugin manager is really cool. Now, if we go up here, plugin extras, I can actually select a plugin. Uh, here's a cool one that probably isn't relevant to everybody, but JFG geoencoding geo support I find to be really useful. And what this is, is you can manually geoencode, but Lightroom really doesn't have metadata functions and stuff built in for coordinates on photos. So what I do when I'm traveling, particularly on my road trips, is I have an app on my iPhone called Geotag Photos Pro. Now, I'm sure you can get different apps. I think that one's actually available for, for uh, Android, maybe even for BlackBerry. I did a post on Pro Photo Show recently of my favorite travel, app, travel apps, and this was one of them. But Geotag Photos Pro, what it does is it just records a trip log. But the cool thing is it'll then upload to their site all that data, and then I can go to the site and download a GPX file. And what this means is that I can go into this Jeffrey's Lightroom Geo Encoding Support plugin, which I think was like 10 bucks, and I can go to a track log, and I can sync all these images to a track log. So let's say I was on a trip, and I took 1,000 photos, and... I want to geoencode them. So the main thing would be to make sure that I had my phone set to the exact same time as my camera. And this is something that, you know, you kind of got to get yourself a, work, a groove for that too of making sure all your times are set right and things like that. Making sure you keep the phone on and the, and the geoencoder running. And I'm getting better at it, but sometimes I still, you know, I realize, oh, it's off. And here I just took 20 photos and I don't have the geoencoding for. But what you can do is you download... And the way this particular app works is you, it uploads it. You go to the site. You download what's called a GPX file, and you can just put that on the desktop and browse to it. Load the GPX file, and it's like this big old text file. It reads all the information, and you can do some settings, you know, like how you interpret the time, how far of a range between photos to allow the track log to apply. You can define all these examples, and then you can geoencode the images, and it will encode all your location metadata into the image. So that's really cool. Uh, this plugin, can, you, it has to do a little update to the catalog once you install it, which is a little bit annoying because it's actually adding a field into the metadata that Lightroom doesn't have by default. Hopefully that'll change in the future and Lightroom by default will have the metadata in there. But this plugin, it's also on the resources list. Really cool plugin for doing geoencoding. So there's tons of little plugins out there. And you know, guys, in the chat room, feel free to shout out your favorite plugins so people get some different ideas of what, of what, to, uh, what to work with. Uh, let's take a quick look at another example and just find something here. Let's just take these two. And here's one that I just started working with. It just came out from on one software called Perfect Layers. Okay, so I'm going to go down here. I've selected two images, and I'm going to start up Perfect Layers. Now, it may take just a minute to load these up. And uh, we're almost almost done officially here. I haven't even registered it yet. And uh, But I just want to cover this real quick. And Thomas, I will get to your question, too, in just a minute. All right, so firing up Perfect Layers here. One thing I've noticed, Perfect Layers is a brand new plugin that OM1 just released, and it's a little slow. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it's Lightroom. It, it is exporting high-res PSDs to this. So, uh, and just uh, OM1Software.com is where you can get this if you like the look of it. And there is uh, Pro Photo Show. We have a deal code that they give us a 15% discount. Promo code is PPSIMG. 
no, excuse me. It's it's promo code is just PPS for Nick Software. That'll give you fifteen percent off. But it's all it's in the it's in the the resource page that I put all my notes on for this workshop at SimeFX.com forward slash LR. Okay, so what we have here, just real quick, and you know, getting into how to use layers and stuff like that. That's kind of stuff for a Photoshop workshop. But what we see, and this is really cool, is we actually have layers without going into Photoshop. Now, here's the thing. And I mean, the advantage of this, I, I think it's really cool. I'm excited about this plugin. I think the advantage could be debat debatable because it took as long to open this in perfect layers as it would have to open it in Photoshop. On the other hand, you know, I mean, I know there's some of you that just use Lightroom. This could give you some more flexibility in terms of using Lightroom to do more and, and without getting into Photoshop. But what's cool is you can go in here and you can set blending modes of this layer, and it actually is really cool. It actually is cooler than Photoshop in this sense, in that you just mouse over and it shows you a preview for the blending mode, okay? But you can also do things like use the brush, the masking brush. It also has the masking bug, which I probably won't get into. I don't want to give a tutorial on this. I don't even know how to use it really well myself yet. But the bottom line is, oopsies. So I got this big brush, and I could brush back in down in here. And paint out that part of the layer. Now, again, if I was doing something this serious, I'd probably go into, into Photoshop most of the time. But that doesn't mean this plugin's not useful. Now, this plugin's about $100. I think that's their intro price is $100, although that uh, promo code would make it a little bit cheaper. But you can get as precise as you want. I'm just giving you a, just a real, really rough kind of idea. I mean, let's say you wanted to blend in HDR or you wanted to make a composite image and you wanted to do that without going into Photoshop. Now, what happens if we then go up here? We can just save this out. And what it's going to do is it's going to save it back in. I'm guessing just as a PSD, there's preferences for this too. You can tell it how, what bit rate you want it to use and all that good stuff. And... Uh, It'll just dump it right back into Lightroom. And I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. And we see it put it right here. It stacked it with the others. And there's that edited version. Now, it's it's really bad, but <laughs> you get the idea of the plugin. Um, I'm just going to delete this because I never want to see it again. So a ton of plugins you can use in Lightroom. Go out there and, look, and, and check some of these out. Uh, I, there, there's a list of some of my favorites on on the download list, which include things like the geoencoding plugin. Keyboard, keyboard Tamer is a cool one that I found that actually allows you to define custom keyboard shortcuts in Lightroom. Perfect Layers, that's a new one. It's pretty cool. Uh, Lightroom Galleries, like uh, Light, LRG1, is a is a web gallery for Lightroom. It's a plugin that gives you another a web gallery that actually has a PayPal cart included in it, so you can do proofing and stuff like that. I don't use that for my proofing, but it looks really cool, and I've played with it, and I've thought about implementing it into some areas. Um, TTG iPhone portfolio. I mean, basically every module of Lightroom, depending on what you're trying to do, has plugins. And you guys already know that because I make extensions for Lightroom too. But there's all this cool stuff you can do, and very, very powerful stuff. So that's it. I think we've covered everything today, and we kind of went over all this stuff. And some pretty advanced stuff, really. The powers of channels, working them with black and white, getting into some noise and detail stuff. Photoshop integration, not a super advanced thing, but something I wanted to touch on and make sure everybody understood how it was all working. And then some plugins and things like that. And it would have been fun to get into some more plugins, but honestly, I mean, I think you get the idea of the plugins. I don't want to turn this into a training session on a particular plugin so much as letting you know, hey, here's some cool stuff. Here's some stuff that I like, but there's tons of other stuff out there too. Go out and find some ways to extend Lightroom. For me, the plugins I use the most are things that give me workflow. I mean, the plugins that do for really fine editing and stuff like that and getting really serious with editing, I don't use those personally a lot because if I'm getting serious edits, I'm going into Photoshop anyhow because it tends to be faster and smoother. I mean, you saw that that brush was a little laggy imperfect layers so I just could have jumped right into Photoshop and honestly probably done that faster but that's not to say it's not a powerful plugin it just depends on what you want to do and it is version one too I'm sure they're going to keep making it better and better so you know in the future will we not even need Photoshop I don't know at the moment for me I still need Photoshop but 
there's a whole lot we can do with Lightroom, and particularly the things that will save you time so you have time to do what you love with your photos. Those are the ones you want to figure out because that workflow stuff is huge. Thomas asked, let's see here. Thomas said uh, he noticed I had several catalogs stacked in my dock, and can you ac access them simultaneously and jump between them? And I, yeah, I, I dropped catalogs in the in the dock, and we covered this, I think, in Lightroom Essentials, or maybe it was the second episode of the workshop here. In terms of, I have a separate catalog for things, so I can manage them well. Uh, all I have to do is click one of these to open it. So if I click my port portfolio catalog, what it's going to do is close this catalog. And then open that one. So you, I can jump back and forth pretty quick because a lot of people open open their photos by opening Lightroom, and it opens whatever the recent catalog is. And if if you only have one catalog, it's pretty much always the same. I mean, I've I've come into peop, ran across people using programs like this, and they didn't even know where their photos were actually stored. They just you know in their mind they were in Lightroom, which is very dangerous because not knowing where things are. We talked about this on a pro photo show that's coming out this week. Uh, you really need to know where those files are so you can manage them. But in answer to your question, Thomas, you cannot ask, access them simultaneously, as in searching between them and things like that. That'd be cool, but there's no way to do that at this time. You can click on any catalog file at any time, and that's why I make shortcuts to catalogs I'm currently using, and it'll open up. Or you can go to Open Recent. So in this case, if I switch back to Test Catalog, it's going to close the current catalog and then pop open the new catalog. So not simultaneously, but you can switch back and forth very quick. And for me, that's good enough uh, because I, and, and I, I break those catalogs out into modules so I can manage the files and the catalogs better. Let's see here. Okay, everybody, well, that is the Lightroom Master. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be hanging around here for a few more minutes. Sorry we went a little bit over, actually, before we even finished the workshop, but sometimes I get talking and get excited about all this stuff. So the next workshop isn't until July 11th, and it, it, I actually added it a little later, but that's the Lightroom Businessman, and we're going to get more into folders and tags and metadata. We're going to look at slideshows, videos, and web galleries using print templates and going further and talking about using Lightroom in the sales room to, to do projecting and stuff like that. If you're in the business of photography, uh, Lightroom can be a really powerful tool for presenting images to clients in, in a proof session. So we're going to cover that. That is on Thursday, July 7th. So a couple weeks, because I'm actually going to be down at the infamous Wall Portrait Conference uh, this, this coming week. And that goes Sunday through Thursday, I think. And boy, if you're in the, in the state of Washington or anywhere where you can get down to this conference, one of the best conferences on making wall portraits and selling wall portraits is ever. Ken Whitmire's a legend in the wall portrait business. So uh, that's where I'm going to be. And then I'll be coming back and uh, the Lightroom businessman on July 7th. And then just quick shout out also, there's going to be the cloning workshop. And you can find that right here, signeffects.com slash clone. So you can check that out on the site. And we're going to learn how to do stuff like this, getting into really manipulating cloning tools, particularly in Photoshop. Because if you're doing a serious clone, that's where you'll be going. But we will be looking at the cloning tools in Lightroom briefly as well. But how to really get in and do really polished refinements on images and effectively clone out anything. Now, that doesn't mean we always should clone out anything, but... Cloning is a very powerful tool, and there's some subtleties of it in terms of keeping things looking natural. You know, when you go to print, you want to make sure that you don't have things looking bad. And, and there's a ton of different tools, particularly in Photoshop, for cloning and patching. All of them work differently in different situations, and we're going to talk about that as well and how each you can leverage each tools to work better for what you want to do. And then the next one that I'm really excited about is the Burn and Dodge Workshop. Now, the Cloning Magic Workshop is coming up. Sorry, I didn't check the date. There's fake Facebook pages and everything for this. This is August. Excuse me. Cloning Magic is going to be July 11th. So it's just a few days after the Lightroom Businessman. And then the next one is the Burn and Dodge Workshop. And we were you probably saw some of these images in the catalog today. And what this does is it shows the original I had once I did my merging and the Burn and Dodge. So go over and check out these examples. I love mouse over examples like this. I use these all over the site. But... 
bottom line is burn and dodge is vastly underused. No, you can't do this kind of burn and dodging in Lightroom. You can do some, and we're going to talk about that. But in terms of really manipulating direction and tone, we're going to talk about all this stuff with burn and dodge and how to really control your images. And I see so many photographs that could be so good, but people don't burn and dodge anymore And a lot of times. Now, I shouldn't, you know, not all of you, but it's definitely an underused tool. I think if it was the only tool Photoshop had, I would still need it because it's that powerful. And if, I'm, if I've got an image going to the wall, it's always getting burn and dodge. I mean, you can have so much impact added to an image by doing good burn and dodge. So just wanted to shout out on those and uh, you can check those out at simefx.com. Simefx.com forward slash LR is where you're going to find the resources for this workshop, including the download with links and promo codes, as well as my favorite shortcuts. There's a PDF you can download and print out there. And there's also some links to freebies and stuff like that, as well as that 30% off promo code. If you're uh, wanting to pick up a new collection of presets or actions or something like that. So I'm going to hang around for a few minutes, but thank you all for attending the Lightroom Master. We'll see you at the Lightroom Businessman in a few weeks and uh, hopefully see you guys at the Cloning Magic and the Burn and Dodge workshops as well. Uh, I'm really enjoying these. They're, we're kind of getting a, a system figured out and I look forward to seeing you all at future workshops. Take care.